and a very warm welcome to the fourth episode of the MZ podcast entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on the Global Oil and Gas Industry. My name is Hubert Pausmann. I'm a professor here at the University of Nicosia. Um, let me talk quickly about the background to this podcast and then introduce you to my two distinguished guests. Um, 2020 has been and will be a black year for the oil and gas industry. A dramatic decline in demand and a dramatic decline in prices has triggered massive problems for the oil and gas companies and will probably affect the way oil and gas is used and traded all over the world. Um, in order to talk about this from a global, regional and local level, I have two really distinguished guests with me. First of all, let me introduce you to Professor Gaudat Baghdad from the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University in Washington. So a very warm welcome across uh, the Atlantic. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Simeon Kasianidis. He's the chairman of the natural gas public company, SciGas. He's also the CEO and chairman of Hyperion Systems Engineering Group. And he's also suffering from severe back pain and is a real hero to make it to this podcast. So particular thank you for you uh, being with us uh, now. Before we go into the actual uh, discussion, I would like to quickly introduce Marinos Papayorki, who is doing technical support, but not only technical support, he's also the coordinator of the MZ podcast series. And he will now explain to you how you can ask your questions. And we hope you will ask your questions or make comments uh, on what we are talking about. Thank you, Hubert. Uh, let me also, by my side, thank you, our distinguished speakers. It's a great honor for us uh, to have you. Uh, as for our audience, they can submit uh, their comments or, uh, or questions through the MC Facebook page, either by posting a comment or a question below the live video, uh, either by sending a message to the MC Facebook page. Thank you, Marinos. We will see more of you later. Now let's go straight into the topic and maybe start with Professor Baghdad. How, I already alluded to uh, some of the consequences of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the global oil and gas industry. How would you describe the impact of this pandemic? Uh, thank you. And first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and it's a great honor to be on this panel and uh, I believe everybody in the world knows uh, how badly the coronavirus has impacted not only oil and gas industry but almost everything in our life. Uh, oil and gas industry uh, has severely been impacted by the virus, uh, especially uh, not only the virus, but also the collapse of oil prices because of uh, OPEC uh, disagreement between OPEC and Russia. I will say a few words about this in a couple of minutes. But first about coronavirus, uh, the oil and to less extent natural gas uh, are used in different uh, sectors housing, uh, commerce, but the main sector, especially as uh, far as oil, petroleum is concerned, is transportation. And what coronavirus has done is uh, brought uh, transportation sector to stand still uh, for understandable reasons. Uh, people are not able to travel, are not able to drive. Basically, people all over the world were ordered to stay home. Uh, because of this, the demand for oil uh, has uh, fell to uh, about 30%. Uh, it will take some time for uh, life to come back to normal for people to drive, to, to fly. But uh, the big uh, impact of coronavirus is on tra transportation sector, that people were forced to stay home. And uh, because of this, uh, the demand has, has significantly declined. Uh, 
this is uh, one important reason for the collapse of oil prices. Uh, on, on the supply side, uh, there was agreement between Russia and OPEC countries led by Saudi Arabia to cut production. Uh, in uh, late March, early April, they could not agree on extending the agreement. And this disagreement between them came in very bad time. Because of this, uh, basically, they, Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, started a price war. They flooded the market with extra supplies. And this is the first time ever uh, oil prices went in negative, meaning producers paid money for anybody to take their oil. So what I'm trying to say on both uh, supply and demand side, there was some developments and there was uh, less demand and more supply. And this how oil prices and to less extent gas prices collapsed. Uh, it will take some time to uh, move from here, but uh, oil OPEC countries agreed with Russia to cut production, and so far they uh, have honored their agreement. Uh, on the demand side, uh, many countries started opening, but it will take some time for uh, people to start again driving and flying. Thank you. Dr. Kassianidis, you want to add something to these observations? Please unmute. I think that uh, the, the comments are very, let's say, accurate and uh, specific. It reminds me, uh, maybe a year or a couple of years ago, there was a big discussion uh, on an international panel about uh, what will be the, the, how will the world move into the renewables? And it was flagged that really the big impact to, to go for the renewable industry will be once uh, transportation changes and uh, it's not dependent on hydrocarbons anymore. So. Uh, and we see that from a completely different point of view that since uh, transportation was actually impacted, effectively the oil industry and gas industry were, were impacted uh, as well. I guess the question is that there is a lot of uh, also uh, international and regional plays. I think we are seeing now maybe a new balance uh, or a new equilibrium coming into place uh, where uh, we have the OPEC countries and Russia, but then we have the United States uh, suffering from having reached the point of the net exporter of hydrocarbons. Now, let's say a lot of their production having stalled. So I think uh, this, uh, what started as a combination of uh, uh, different independent events uh, combined into, in terms of making a, a, a significant impact on the whole industry which has an impact on, on everything else, uh, whether it is on a global or a regional or even a local basis to we'll discuss uh, a bit later on. Okay, maybe, maybe to stay with you and stay on that topic, how do you see the future of oil and gas prices in the next year? Will there be a recovery and maybe related to that, uh, will oil and gas remain competitive in comparison to other sources of energy, in particular also renewable energy? Well, I think that uh, I, as far as uh, my view is concerned is that uh, the, we are not yet to a point of maturity or, or penetration that let's say the oil and gas uh, will be replaced by renewables. I think there's a number of things that, uh, that will need to be resolved first and that is uh, whether it is storage, whether it is cheaper uh, production of electricity or whether it is uh, actually being able to shift uh, transportation, aviation, and shipping into renewables, because uh, that is a, a major component of the consumption of, uh, of oil and gas. Now, we've had cycles in the, in the industry that uh, are like 10, 15 year cycles, uh, that let's say uh, the, you have a reduction and an increase of the prices and so forth. 
So I, I, I think that, let's say, maybe they will not remain to the level that they are today, but slowly, slowly, we, we, with, the, with the global economy mobilizing again, I think, let's say, uh, we should see a, a relative increase in prices. Uh, that's, that's my view. Back to pre-crisis levels or way below pre-crisis levels? Well, it depends on what we call the pre-crisis levels. I, I, I don't think we're going to go to the $100, let's say, yeah. but let's say maybe the $50 or $60 uh, where the, the economy had reached a certain equilibrium, uh, maybe we would probably see something like that. Of course, you know, if we had a crystal ball, we would be in a different business. So. <laughs> yes, and much richer, all of us. But uh, <laughs> Professor Bagdad, uh, your views on my questions. How do you see the future? of oil and gas prices and how do you, how competitive will they be in comparison to other sources of energy? I, I believe I can identify uh, one long term and one short term impact. In the long term, there, ha there has been a move away from oil and gas to uh, renewable energy and to a less extent nuclear power. In, uh, in the industry, they call this energy transition. And uh, the whole world is interested in climate change. And uh, it is well documented that hydrocarbon resources, coal, oil, and gas are polluting uh, sources of energy. So uh, because of this, uh, and also because of fluctuation in prices and political instability in some Middle Eastern, some oil producing countries, uh, the whole world has been moving away from coal, oil, and gas. And I believe this will continue. Uh, again, the great majority of people, the great majority of governments believe in climate change, that it is man-made and that oil and gas and coal contribute to pollution. So there has been strong move to energy transition away from oil and gas to uh, renewable and nuclear. Uh, in the short term, I believe uh, what coronavirus has done, uh, many people have experienced working from home and in the United States here, and I'm sure in many other countries, uh, now there are some jobs will be permanently from home. Uh, people will, uh, even when the virus is finally contained, people will continue working from home. This uh, might uh, have some long-term impact on the demand for oil and gas. So, uh, I mean, in my mind, I have been in the United States for more than 36 years. I have been through September 11, and September 11 made big change in life here in the United States. I believe coronavirus is much bigger than September 11. Uh, it is the whole world, and I do not believe uh, at one point life will be back to pre coronavirus. And this is why I believe in oil and gas industry, there will be permanent change on how we do business. Thank you. Okay, this sounds uh, well, impressive. And if we, if, we, if we break it down from a global to a more regional debate on the area we are in, the Eastern Mediterranean. Eastern Mediterranean gas is usually deep sea gas, which is usually rather expensive gas. So what, what is the implication or what are the implications of this drop in demand and prices for the prospect of the regional exploitation and exploration of oil uh, and, uh, and, uh, and gas? Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Kassiandidis, if you, if you want to start. Uh, I think uh, clearly the, the short-term impact of, uh, of this uh, has been that uh, uh, it put in question the, the, the development and exploration of production uh, and further, let's say, uh, drilling and, and plants uh, in the short term. I think uh, we have to be, uh, let's say, aware, I guess is the word uh, to use, that uh, uh, 
it's a government play mainly, and governments do want to bring the, the resources out and monetize their resources for the benefit of the people. So that combined with, let's say, the, uh, the technology as the technology develops, because let's say a few years ago, uh, things were not different. They were a lot different technologically than what uh, they are today. And uh, probably in a couple of years from, from today, things will be different uh, again. So I think uh, the crisis brings a lot of development. Uh, crisis brings a lot of challenges. And I think uh, because you have the, the drive of the public sector together with the needs of the people, I think this will drive probably into a, a more optimum exploitation of uh, resources driven by the need to monetize this, uh, this use. I think uh, you, we have seen in Cyprus, for example, that let's say the, the, there has been a delay now. I mean, one of the delays has been because the ships could not operate. Uh, due, or they could not be, uh, you could say, okay, a drill ship in the middle of nowhere is isolated and uh, doesn't get affected, but the drill ship needs to be supplied from the coast uh, needs to have uh, food, uh, needs to have uh, resources and so forth. So when you have a lockdown in a country and you can't uh, service the vessels, let's say, then you have a problem. So it's a combination of the COVID-19 uh, delaying everything, plus the price may be becoming uneconomical. Uh, but the uneconomical is always a factor of the size of the discovery. Because if you have a very big discovery, then let's say, all these things uh, change in terms of the economies of scale. So I think that uh, we will uh, we will see how things right now. The the plan, from what I understand, in all the different uh, localities. I mean, the ISMED uh, pipeline and the ISMED forum uh, is still ongoing and going strong. Uh, there is a bit of a let's say. An impasse right now. I, I agree that uh, the vision and, and view for everybody is to move on to renewables. Uh, gas, though, is uh, one of the fuels that allows the increased penetration of renewables. And we see this in, in all the countries that have shifted from liquid fuels to gas fuels. So if you take all these factors together, I think uh, maybe in a year or uh, let's say once we have some sort of a new stability, uh, then uh, there will be renewed activity in the East Mediterranean for further exploration and production. I mean, if we look at the expected reserves that uh, have been here and what has been discovered already, it's only a fraction. So uh, if we try to be and put a different angle to it, that basically uh, the proper monetization of these uh, reserves uh, could lead to stability in the region and, and prosperity for the people, then, uh, and not so much uh, drive in terms of the profit, then we're looking about a completely different uh, situation. Uh, so that's my two bits. <laughs> that's an optimistic bit. Uh, Professor Bachdad, what is your view on the implications of the corona crisis on the oil and gas? prospects for exploitation and exploration in the East Med? Uh, you, usually when oil prices uh, go down, uh, there is less money to invest. And uh, already many big oil companies, big and small, have already cut on their investment. And uh, it takes some time to have new balance between supply and demand. So what is happening now, which is not different from previous cycles, uh, low oil prices and low gas prices are forcing uh, oil and gas companies to invest less, uh, which means there will, there will be less production, less supply, uh, and also low oil and gas encourage uh, consumption. So there will be more demand, and this is where there will be new balance between supply and demand. So uh, for some time, there will be less investment, which will impact uh, East Mediterranean countries, uh, because as you mentioned, it is uh, mainly under sea, 
so it is more expensive. Uh, another factor is uh, shell gas in the United States. As everybody knows, uh, Shell Revolution here in the United States started at least 20 years ago or more, and the United States now exports natural gas. Uh, but most of the gas US exports is LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, in East Mediterranean, so far, to the best of my knowledge, Uh, the gas is exported by pipelines. There are talks about liquefied natural gas and some projects, uh, but uh, to some extent, uh, there is a regional market for natural gas. And uh, in East Mediterranean, in Cyprus and Israel and uh, other countries, uh, Europe is the, the closest market and uh, Europe needs gas. But again, as I said before, Europe and the rest of the world are moving to diversify their energy mix. They are trying to import less oil and gas and use more renewable. But uh, East Mediterranean gas is perfect for Europe, very close market. And uh, I believe uh, there will be a need, there is already a big need for East Mediterranean gas in Europe. The challenge which uh, we can talk about, uh, if you like, at any point, the challenge is to address political disagreement between uh, major uh, gas producers in East Mediterranean. Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, and other countries. Thank you. I think, okay, uh, yeah, just you to, want to, just to yeah. add uh, on that, I think uh, uh, for completion, I, we don't, I don't uh, disagree with what was said. Uh, uh, there are two LNG, there are two liquefaction plants already in operation in Egypt. Uh, actually, the, the Aphrodite monetization plan, let's say for Cyprus, was to take a pipeline to Egypt for being converted into LNG in one of the plants and uh, to be exported. So I think there is no immediate other uh, plants uh, for Cyprus or for uh, that I know of in the region for new liquefaction facilities. Uh, however, I do, it has been discussed that the Egyptians uh, Uh, depending on things, would be looking into increasing the capacity of their two liquefaction plants there. And of course, uh, it has been declared uh, from Cyprus uh, government that uh, assuming that there is enough uh, discoveries uh, in, the, in the region and in Cyprus and through a cooperation, uh, the Cyprus government would be interested to host or place a liquefaction plant uh, On, on the island. Uh, and uh, also, uh, but as I said, I mean, also before, and as uh, was said by uh, Professor Dada uh, before, the, it, it is, uh, I think what we have to keep in mind is that this industry is characterized by long time scales. It's not something that is going to, I mean, it's not something to have the next six months or over the next year and so forth. So the question is, when we reach this stability again, which we are going to be reaching some stability, whether at the point of that stability, the demands and the political factors that were touched are such that uh, justify the, uh, the further monetization of their resources, uh, even at this deep uh, depth uh, that they are today. Uh, to touch on a completely different uh, uh, concept, which is not unrelated. Uh, Cyprus uh, connection, let's say, with the Eurasia interconnector for electricity, when it was being discussed a few years ago, it was a complete impossibility. Uh, now the technology has moved to the point that, let's say, having an interconnector between Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, and Europe is, uh, is, is not an impossibility anymore. It's just a uh, Uh, technically, it's a matter of course. So, okay. 
Yeah, thank you, thank you for this for this addition. We we alluded already on on regional cooperation and maybe the problems in the region. So let me follow up with that with in with respect to the East Med Gas Forum as as an as an an organ and in, an emerging institution of cooperation between some countries in the in the Eastern Mediterranean in the attempt to exploit oil and gas. Maybe attached to it, the East Med pipeline. Uh, Professor Baghdad alluded to it is one project trying to bring uh, gas from the East Mediterranean to Europe. So two questions in one, how, how effective, or how mature, how useful is the East Med Gas Forum within this project of trying to utilize gas in the Eastern Mediterranean and what are the prospects, the economic viability for the East Med pipeline? I don't know, Professor uh, Baghdad, if you want to, Baghdad, if you want to begin. Yeah, I, I believe it is a good start and it's always a good idea to institutionalize cooperation between countries. So the creation of the forum, I believe, is a good step forward. But also, uh, given the instability in some countries, I believe uh, good cooperation between the governments is, is a, a step forward, but not enough. Uh, what I'm trying to say is very important to promote cooperation people to people promote culture awareness uh, so the, the organization will have a long life it will I mean probably my, my concern if there is military coup if there is change in government in x country this might impact the organization so i believe in the long term it is good idea to uh, promote uh, culture cooperation uh, get peoples in all the countries involved to get to know each other, understand each other. This will give uh, deeper uh, roots to the organization. And, and also, I believe it's important to uh, be inclusive. Uh, there is, I believe, wrong perceptions that the organization uh, is against some countries. I mean, uh, we're talking about economics, talking about making money. So I believe the organization is win-win and it should fight the wrong perception that it is political organization. It is energy organization, economic organization about benefiting all members and it should not be perceived that it is against any regional power. Okay, Dr. Kassianidis, your views on the East Med Gas Forum and the viability of the East Med Pipeline as, a, as an export route into Europe. No, I think, I think I agree entirely with what was said before. I think the discoveries in all the different countries are, are, are uh, how you say, it, the East Mediterranean is a regional play. It's not something that one country can demand or define or, or, or rule. I mean, they, uh, Israelis today are exporting to Jordan, they're exporting to Palestine, they have a plant to export to Egypt, we have uh, Cyprus looking to export and cooperate uh, with the different countries. I think the, the quantities that have been discovered in the reserves in the different countries, let's say isolated, uh, around the risk of being stranded. So I think like uh, by definition, uh, the economic uh, benefit for all will come through a proper regional cooperation. And, and if, let's say, indeed, we have the vision, uh, maybe the optimistic vision, as uh, I was said before, that uh, uh, we can get the people to have this, uh, let's say, cooperation, it can lead to prosperity and peace, which will lead to further economic development and uh, further prosperity and peace in the, in the area. So I, I am completely for the idea, and uh, I think... Uh, I think we have a big uh, potential incentive and driver that uh, can help us go down that uh, direction. The East Med pipeline is indeed uh, a project that is uh, financed. I think there are technical challenges. Uh, it's not something that can happen uh, in the next year or so. There will be a lot of work, uh, mainly uh, the technical challenges of how to handle the the depths in the sea and the non-uniformity of the seabed in the eastern Mediterranean until it reaches uh, 
uh, e, let's say, Greece uh, or Crete or whatever, however the path will be determined in the end. But I think there's many different ways uh, to look at it. And I think that is uh, being looked at very uh, carefully and a lot of uh, support has been provided by the European Union to stay in order to do all the studies. So again, I think uh, uh, if you have a strong enough reason, which we seem to have, uh, the, uh, and uh, there is uh, good and solid technology, and let's say technology, I'm a believer in technology, and I believe, let's say, with the right incentives and funding, uh, most problems can be solved. So I, I would not be excluding the possibility of the instrument pipeline, not, maybe not now, but maybe in five years. Okay, we've been, we've been so far talking about, an, or not talking about, and talking about an elephant in the room uh, that causes problems within all these uh, future ideas about the East Med, and that is the confrontation between Turkey, uh, and in particular the Republic of Cyprus, but not only Cyprus, also with Greece, there's there are also problems with Israel and Egypt, so we have one country that feels excluded from these developments in the Eastern Mediterranean and has responded rather aggressively to it, also acting on behalf of the Turkish Cypriots who are also not too happy about the unilateral exploitation by the Greek Cypriot side. So we have confrontations going on. How do you see this interfering and playing out within the prospects for the development of the East Met in terms of oil and gas exploitation? Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Kassianidis, I, I think uh, if you want to start. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Maybe it's not the right thing to say, but I think Turkey is positioning itself like Iran has positioned itself in the East, uh, in, in the Arabian Gulf. So I think uh, no, no country in, uh, uh, in the East Med, at least what has been said publicly, uh, wants to exclude Turkey. I think uh, everybody wants to be inclusive of Turkey, and, uh, but let's say Inclusive of Turkey doesn't mean that inviting somebody to take the lead and dominate everybody under that. So I think the the issues for Cyprus, uh, of course, is the most vulnerable of all the countries in the region, being the smallest one and having the political problem and so forth. But I think uh, Cyprus is probably the first one that would welcome a uh, and normalization of uh, relationships with Turkey for the benefit uh, of, uh, of all. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, it's, it's a Cyprus uh, thing as such. I think, let's say, uh, Turkey has claims uh, on, on many different... Uh, if you look at uh, their published uh, maps, let's say, it has claims on the EZ of uh, many of the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I think the foreign minister here offered to go to The Hague to have a discussion. I think that was even yesterday, if I read the papers this morning correctly. So I think that uh, the fact of the matter with this time frame, we have, uh, we have gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. What has been discovered right now is gas. What uh, the general industry view is that the, the era of gas is the next 30 years maybe. So every year that goes by, which without exploitation of the gas, is one year late. Uh, because then you will have uh, maybe renewables, maybe hydrogen, maybe, I mean, there would be other forms and we would move. Uh, you had the period of, uh, of the liquid fuels, the, the crude. Now you're, we're moving into the gas, which is cleaner, not as clean, but cleaner. And, and some are talking about it as a transition fuel, but is more is a different fuel rather than a transition, and then it will move on. I think uh, the more squabbling and uh, political unrest that acts as uh, a deterrent to the monetization is actually against the interests of all countries in the region, including Turkey. So I think uh, Turkey could have this, it has a big market, has a big need for the gas. Uh, its economy could benefit uh, greatly. Uh, I think uh, it's a matter of uh, getting everybody on the table. On the other hand, I think that, let's say, as I said, the needs of all these countries, in my view, is uh, strong enough that uh, they will find a balance uh, to proceed, uh, maybe without Turkey. But I mean, ideally, there would be a regional cooperation for the benefit of all. Professor Bakhat, do you have views on this? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, if I may, I, I want to make three points. I believe uh, in economics, as I said, everybody wins. Uh, the gas discoveries, they will make money, they will uh, support prosperity to all people uh, in uh, the region. So uh, I believe uh, the gas discoveries, gas industry, the profit, all these things can, can help promote peace between, uh, between Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, and other countries. In policy, it is one side wins, the other side loses. In economics, uh, it has the potential that everybody can win. And I believe it depends on uh, how the leaders can find compromise and can use uh, this wealth to support political dialogue. Uh, the other point I want to make as we speak now, there is uh, prospects for war between Turkey and Egypt and Libya. And uh, I believe the, the world is well connected and any conflict in Libya between Egypt and Turkey, which will be crazy. And I do not think this will happen, but uh, leaders are making threats and, uh, and I, I, I see some impact of this on uh, oil and gas industry in Cyprus and Israel and other countries. Uh, the last point I, I want to make about uh, the role of global powers, mainly European Union and the United States. Uh, the conflicts between uh, Greece and Turkey, Cyprus and Turkey, are, uh, have been there for a long time. And I believe uh, United States, even with coronavirus, but the United States is still the leader of the free world. And both uh, Greece and uh, Turkey are members in NATO and uh, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, and other countries have warm relations with the United States, with EU. I believe global powers can facilitate dialogue between all parties. Uh, at the end, uh, regional powers have to make the decisions, but global powers, United States and EU, can facilitate, can and should facilitate regional dialogue. Thank you. Okay, let me let me end the part, the, the dialogue part of this of this podcast by merging two questions into one that are focusing more on the local aspect. So I will start with uh, Dr. Kasianidis. Uh, the, the coronavirus has also led to the delay and postponement of explorative and appraisal drillings all around Cyprus. So activities have stopped with the exception of Turkish activities, which are clearly political and not uh, commercially driven. Um, so will they return? Is there a prospect for Cypriot gas and the exploitation for Cypriot gas once this crisis is over? Will the companies return? And if yes, uh, where could, can Cypriot gas go to in, a, in an economically viable way? And then the question, that's a question to both of you, but the question to you as, as the chairman of, of CyGas is that uh, Cyprus signed a deal with a Chinese consortium about the import of, uh, of liquefied gas. Um, will, will the Cypriots benefit from the low prices we have? Will we, will we be in an era of low prices and how does that relate to the long-term contracts uh, uh, in this context? I think you touched on three different points. So you question. have a point. You have you have three points. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's the the declared intent of both uh, of all Exxon, Total, and ENI is that let's say uh, within a year in 2021 uh, they will uh, return with the exploration and production program. So they have not cancelled. Uh, they have not uh, deferred indefinitely. They have agreed and stated a new, uh, new time frame for their exploration and, uh, and production to start. Uh, I've, I've been involved in meetings myself in this last couple of weeks where I can confirm that that is the intent. Of course, things can change, but let's say right now, 
all the planning is 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 done on that basis. Uh, let's say that within a year, within 2021, uh, we will uh, have a resumption of the of the exploration uh, for the of the exploration program. Now, for the development and production, we only have one field right now that is Aphrodite. Uh, Aphrodite has uh, agreed with the Republic of Cyprus to take FID by 2023. So that is where they're supposed to do all the studying and all the different things and so forth. So uh, while uh, I said before, we're looking at long time scale. So yes, we are today 2020. They have to decide by 2023. So I'm not, uh, I don't think we have any indication that they actually stopped doing any work about it. It's just uh, the decision is, uh, is not going to come early. It might come uh, within the agreed uh, time. Frame. Now, you touched upon the, the Cyprus gas. Uh, so the Cyprus gas, uh, let's say, what we have done is uh, completely disengaged the decision about importing gas for the energy needs of Cyprus with the development of the Cyprus Reserve. Uh, the, the interrelation between what happens with the Cyprus gas and uh, the availability of natural gas for power generation uh, was the main cause, one of the main causes for the failure of the previous three attempts to bring in natural gas to Cyprus because there was the concept or the thought that uh, we now discovered gas in six months, everybody is going to have gas in their house. Well, it doesn't quite work like that, and, and we live to see that it doesn't. So what we have right now is uh, we went through a tender process, and we went through a definition of a, a project to create uh, and build an LNG import terminal, the Cyprus uh, LNG import terminal. Uh, that uh, is going to import gas, at, uh, and uh, let's say the need of that was uh, recognized also by the European Union. Uh, secured, we secured all the funding. We've got the European Commission giving a 101 million euro grant. Uh, we've had a 150 million euro uh, loan uh, from EIB approved, 80 million from uh, EBRD approved, and 43 in terms of. Uh, a capital injection for the infrastructure, which is a, in a subsidiary company that was provided by the electricity authority. So the project is well funded, is well justified, and it is actually proceeding. It is true that let's say the contract was awarded to a consortium led by CPT, which is a Chinese uh, company. Uh, effectively, the, the consortium is uh, is four companies, two Chinese, uh, one Norwegian, and one uh, Greek company. Uh, actually, the lion's share of the contract will be with the Norwegians who are going to undertake the operations and maintenance for a period of 10 plus 10 years once the project uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, delivered. Now, the only thing that we have in terms of long term is the 10 years operations and maintenance contract. The supply, which is coming back to your third question about the, uh, the price of gas and the ability to benefit for the low prices and so forth. Right now we have, uh, we were running a competition, another tender for the expression of interest to be followed by an RFQ phase for the supply of gas. Uh, we haven't committed or signed anything. Uh, we have 25 companies from all over the world that have expressed uh, a desire to sell to Cyprus uh, gas. And because uh, it is considered to be a good, reliable partner with a very, it, uh, it's a small, but it's a captive uh, market for, uh, for the providers. What, uh, Cygas, Zefa, the natural gas company of Cyprus is intending to do is to sign uh, what is called the master sales agreements with as many of the companies as qualified that will allow us to purchase gas on the spot market and to sign a, two, a three to five year medium term uh, contract with one company for the base, uh, base level quantity. 
the tender for this is going to come out by the end of the year. Those that will qualify will be invited to bid. So we do think and feel that we will be able to benefit significantly from uh, from the current, let's say, uh, supply of, of gas. Now, uh, on the question as to oh, the current prices, on the question as to what happens with our own reserves, I think, let's say, once the, the public does come and monetize uh, let's say the the, the hydrocarbons, the gas uh, reserves of Cyprus, then uh, they will have to come and sell to the natural gas company at a competitive price in order for us to to purchase. So I think uh, the Cyprus gas company has been uh, formed with the objective of passing all the benefit to the people. So it's not a profit making, it's not driven by profit. All the benefit will go to the people. So we hope that uh, in the next two years, uh, let's say, because we expect that uh, we will have gas coming to Cyprus, the first uh, gas coming at the end of uh, summer 22. So we expect that uh, a combination of uh, a very favorable financing, uh, good prices and so forth, will lead to what is required or what is uh, our objective to lower the electricity prices for the people. So okay. that's my answer. That's good news for me. That's a good news for me as somebody living in Cyprus and paying the high electricity bills. Uh, Professor Bachtat, maybe quickly, if you gonna, want to add your comments and then we open up to the audience. Sure. Uh, I, uh, for sure, I do not speak for the United States government, but uh, the global economy is well integrated. Anything happens in one place uh, has impact on the rest of the economy, the rest of the world. So uh, from American perspective, I believe uh, uh, the development of gas reserves, gas deposits in East Mediterranean is very positive development. And hopefully it will add to uh, economic prosperity, political stability in the region. And uh, from this perspective, I believe the United States uh, strongly supports these efforts. And it is not only good for the region, it is go good for global uh, peace and for, for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on my dear colleague Marinos to convey questions and comments from the audience to our speakers. Yes, thank you, Hubert. Um, basically, we had several questions and, and comments. Um, basically, a lot of them, a lot of the questions uh, were answered by our speakers. Uh, so I tried to group a lot of the comments and, and, and the questions. Uh, a very interesting uh, question is about um, the, the EU's Green Deal. So the question is, uh, does the EU's Green Deal threaten the oil and gas industry? And another backup question, is this deal too ambitious? Thank you. Um, Professor Bakhtat, you, you want to start? Or do you want to answer to that question? Okay, uh, I... Uh... I uh, probably I, I don't have anything uh, new to add, but uh, cooperation between the countries uh, reaching economic deal will spill over to policy and will help uh, to promote political dialogue between all countries. Thank you. Dr. Kazianidis, you have a comment on this? I, I think that uh, a whether it is uh, too ambitious or not is something that we will uh, find out uh, over the next few years. I think the main uh, the main factor will be the the ability or the the pace in which technology develops uh, to be able to manifest and bring that into a reality. I think. Uh, uh, it is not a matter of, let's say, taking a, an arbitrary decision and saying we want to achieve that by then. Uh, now is the work to be able to, to move to the path of, uh, of going that way. So there's a number of uh, factors that take uh, place and are, let's say, uh, can contribute positively. For example, the storage of, let's say, electricity in terms of uh, 
let's say power generation. I mean, is is one of them. The other one is in production of hydrogen. I mean, there's a there's a lot of uh, different things. So, as a as a political objective, I think it's something that provides a driver and the and the move and the funding uh, for the technology to happen. Uh, how fast we'll get there is something that will remain to be seen. Marinos, next question or comment. Uh, so another question is um, is about smaller uh, countries. So what do you think of smaller producing countries such as Sudan, Uganda, uh, in the face of this pandemic and the low record of oil demand? Are they going to lose out in the global market? So this is a question. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, can I say? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, one thing about uh, the collapse of oil prices and coronavirus, uh, some major oil producing countries, especially in the Gulf, uh, long time ago created what is known as oil funds, like Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, Qatar Investment Authority, Kuwait Investment Authority. And these funds have substantial financial resources. They have a lot of money. And uh, now, with very much the collapse of global economy, uh, they are using their financial muscles to invest uh, in different areas. And uh, I believe some small countries will benefit from this investment. I mean, uh, major oil producing countries in the Gulf, even with low oil prices, they still have a lot of money and uh, they are using this money not only to uh, help their national economies, but also to find uh, good deals every place in the world. So small countries will benefit from these rich oil funds in the short and long terms. Do Dr. Kazanidis, you wanna add something to this? No, I, uh, I mean, uh, this, uh... The only thing I would also mention in a way is that uh, uh, usually what we see, and I think it started to be seen, is uh, uh, the effect of the, you know, when the upstream market suffers, the downstream market uh, prospers. So what you have now is increased investment in petrochemicals. Uh, you see some of the oil majors uh, investing in petrochemicals. Uh, we've had uh, two weeks ago Aramco taking a big position in Sabit. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it's a moving world that is uh, developing. I think what Dr. Gardab said is uh, I'm in full agreement. So again, things will move on. Marinos, move on is a good point. Move on with the next question. So uh, the, the next question is the last one. and. Basically, I think uh, it can lead us uh, to the final remarks uh, by our speakers. Uh, so the question is, uh, will the oil industry recover from this uh, pandemic crisis? Dr. Kazianidis, you want to take the lead? Will the oil industry recover from this crisis? I, I believe that, uh, let's say we, you know, the oil industry will recover, it will reach a new, it will be different. It would not be the same. Uh, we will have a different uh, reality, but uh, I think uh, it is a crisis. A lot of uh, we've seen a lot of the companies changing. We've had, uh, uh, you know, Shell changing, Exxon Mobil changing. We've had the smaller players trying to uh, reposition and change. I think uh, we have reinvestments. We've had this. So I think we've entered into a period of transition. Uh, I think, unfortunately, transition in our industry usually means uncertainty, and the uncertainty could lead to, you know, not that projects stop, uh, uh, projects get paused, they don't get canceled, uh, they wait until the new equilibrium is reached before they kick back in again, and I think, let's say, uh, if we're not talking about the next six months or one year, but we're looking at the next two to five years, I think, uh, we will have a, a recovery. Now, to what point? Uh, that is a different question. Uh, Professor Bakhtar? 
Okay, I, I always like to end on optimistic note and uh, for, uh, for oil and gas industry, uh, some people uh, have already started talking about the end of oil era, that uh, oil era is behind us. Uh, I do not agree with this. Uh, it is true that electric cars, for example, are making big advances and uh, very soon uh, there will be much more uh, electric cars in all markets, uh, but uh, we still need oil. Uh, there is no electric uh, aeroplanes. Uh, uh, petrochemical industry is important, plastic and other things. So uh, it is true that uh, the renewable and nuclear power are uh, capturing more share in the global energy uh, mix, but uh, still, till today, till this moment, oil and gas are uh, the main source of energy all over the world. The key word in uh, oil industry is diversification, a little bit of oil, a little bit of gas, uh, renewable and nuclear. And, uh, the, the future will be a mixture, mixture of everything. And I believe uh, oil and gas industry will be alive in the next, uh, as far as we can see. Thank you. Well, that sounds already like a very good concluding remark, but I want to give you the opportunity if there's anything else on the topic I forgot you to ask or you forgot to say. Uh, if you have anything to add, then please uh, do it now. If there's anything uh, you would like to say as a concluding remark, or you're fine with what you just said. I would like to thank you and people who uh, uh, contributed to this discussion. And, and again, I believe whoever is interested in energy and oil, what has happened in the last few months is good learning experience to all of us. And I believe if you are in oil and gas sector in renewable, uh, the future, it is not re renewable. It's not either or. It is not renewable or oil. Uh, probably I, I would not say the same about coal. Coal is very dirty and I do not see a future for coal. But I believe in the future we'll have renewable, nuclear, we'll have oil and gas. And there is enough for everybody. Thank you. Dr. Kazenidis, there's also enough for you, enough time for you for your final comments, or as I said, anything I did not ask you, anything you would like to add in the context of our debate. Dr. Oh, I, th I think uh, two things. The one thing is uh, the concept of petrochemicals and plastics and so forth is something that is often missed in the discussions. Uh, uh, when people talk about the oil era, I think, let's say, in any room that you sit, anything you turn around, a big proportion of uh, material that is used is sourced uh, from petrochemicals, uh, which is actually sourced from hydrocarbons. So what uh, is it, not a matter of, uh, let's say, how you say, we, we tend to talk about the replacement of the, or the end of the oil uh, era only in view of uh, being replaced as a fuel, but let's say there are other uses. So I would agree entirely that uh, we have uh, uh, many years ahead for uh, for the oil industry and it will recover. Now, for uh, just as a closing remark, uh, let's say for Cyprus, I think I would like to say that uh, uh, what we have achieved right now is uh, very significant. Uh, we have the uh, let's say the foundation uh, uh, event, uh, let's say next week, uh, in two weeks on the 9th of uh, July. So basically the project uh, is a reality. It is progressing, uh, it will happen. And this uh, Cyprus in its own microcosm is going to be a demonstration of uh, what a, a, a big transformation in everything related to, because uh, our project will change too many things in terms of how the economies work, how the importation of fuel works, how the electricity is, uh, is uh, being uh, generated, the opening of the electricity market, uh, new jobs, attraction of industry. So we are uh, today in a milestone period that uh, could uh, prove to be the beginning of uh, a new development
development uh, in a new era for uh, for Cyprus. So I am optimistic. I remain optimistic, and uh, I base the optimism in the good successes that have been achieved through the co cooperation and participation of all stakeholders in order to be able to make this a reality. So with that, I would also like to thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience and not having everybody wear a tie. <laughs> we are, we are uh, great, we're grateful for this inconvenience. <laughs> yes. so. Well, I thank you for your participation and cooperation. So a very warm thank you to both of you and your valuable contribution to this fourth podcast on our MC series uh, on the impact of coronavirus. Um, let me promote the fifth episode uh, of the MC podcast, which will be about COVID-19 and the Middle East security, a challenge and an opportunity uh, where my dear colleague, uh, Professor Farid mirbagher will talk to His Excellency, the ambassador of Egypt, Hesham Youssef. Uh, what's left to me, as I said, thank you too again, and I would like to thank uh, Marinos as well for all his support and assistance. Uh, a warm thank you to the audience for listening to us. I hope you enjoyed what might not be a milestone in podcast history, but hopefully an entertaining podcast. Um, please enjoy and continue to tune into this podcast series, which is held under the, umbrella, under the umbrella of the School of Law of the University of Nicosia. So I wish you all a very, very pleasant evening. And to Dr. Kasianidis, a very, very speedy recovery. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.